Few things in life are more subjective than music. Toe-tapping melodies to one may be nothing more than raucous noise to another. But there are several types of noise that all agree is, well, just noise. It may be static, caused by poor reception, whining from the generator, switch pops, or even ECM buzz. Whatever the cause, noise is noise, no matter what it interferes with, whether it be Mozart, Metallica, or Johnny and the Moondogs. But identifying noise and actually diagnosing it, well, that's an entirely different matter. Last year alone, on average, over 40% of the audio components returned to Delco were rated NTF, or no trouble found. Worse yet, over 75% of the steering wheel control keypads and SWC modules were returned with no trouble found. Now, you may be saying that's Buick's problem or that's Delco's problem. But what kind of service quality is it when your customer must go through the inconvenience of being without their car while it's in your service department only to return and find out the problem still exists? No, I think it then becomes a problem for your customer, a customer who may decide to go somewhere else next time around. So, what can be done about it? Plenty. This program was designed to help both the technician and the service advisor to work as a team to properly identify, diagnose, and repair most audio system complaints. We'll begin by demonstrating proven techniques to isolate different types of complaints. Then we'll cover various methods of diagnosis and repair. And lastly, we'll conclude with some new and improved procedures for servicing steering wheel control systems. It all begins with the service advisor who must get accurate and complete information from the customer. To help, use this audio diagnostic form found in the technician reference manual or the service advisor guide. As you can see, the form is quite thorough and because you're getting first-hand information from the customer, simply filling it out will go a long way towards saving time by helping you isolate one condition from another. Begin filling out the form by getting the customer to demonstrate the condition. This is the critical first step in isolating the customer complaint to one of three possible conditions. There's noise, such as generator whine or switch pops, then reception problems, which involve variables such as signal strength or atmospheric conditions, and lastly, an inoperative condition, such as a speaker that doesn't work. Look at it this way. It's just like a no-start condition. The first step is to determine if it's a fuel, electrical, or mechanical problem. <laughs> Pick the wrong one and you'll have a long day with little to show. Now before we get back to our service advisor here, let's take a closer look at the two conditions that are most often misunderstood, reception and noise, beginning with reception. Radio waves are electromagnetic lines of force that are transmitted from a tower and cut across your car's antenna. This develops a very low voltage signal that is boosted by the radio's amplifier and sent to the speakers so you can hear it. But sometimes things get in the way, distorting the signal. Driving by large buildings or rolling hills can often block the radio signal, causing the radio to cut out momentarily, increase static, or even go out completely, depending on the strength of the signal. Large buildings or even hills can cause another condition called multipathing. FM radio waves from the station in which the car radio is tuned can bounce off a building and cross back over the antenna, canceling the signal so it sounds like the radio cut out. Perhaps the most common reception condition is simply driving out of the radio station's broadcast range. Being on the fringe of the broadcast area can increase static or hiss. On average, the effective range of an FM signal is about 25 miles, and for AM, it can be over 100 miles, depending on the signal strength of the station. Other factors that can affect reception are road overpasses, high-tension wires, weather, tunnels, even the time of day. These factors just mentioned are normal and vary from location to location. However, a problem with the audio system can increase conditions beyond acceptability. We'll get into diagnosing these later, but next, let's talk about noise. 
Every electrical component in the car produces an electrical field. Some are quite strong, such as the generator, wiper motor, blower motor, ignition system, and so on. Under normal conditions, these systems do not interfere with the audio system. When they do, they can create audible noises. For example, a blower motor, which is an electromagnetic device, generates an electromagnetic field. If a problem develops, such as a bad ground, the electromagnetic field will increase. When these lines of force cut across the antenna, the coax, wiring, or even the radio case, a low voltage signal can be created. This unwanted signal is called noise. When this happens, the customer will hear a whine any time the blower is on that varies with the blower motor speed. So, there you have it. Reception and noise. Now let's get back to our service advisor and see how she is doing. As mentioned earlier, be sure to fill out the form completely. This will become one of the technician's key tools used to effectively diagnose and repair the audio system. If your customer describes what could be a noise or reception condition, it's best to continue with the car outside, away from fluorescent lighting and metal structures. Although we can't cover the entire process, here's a few of the key highlights emphasizing the importance of filling out the form. Determine if a noise or reception condition is present with the key in one or more of the following positions. Accessory, key on, engine off, or key on, engine running. This is very useful for isolating a noise to a specific component. Make sure, though, that you leave the key in each position for at least 30 seconds. This is important as some components only operate for a short period of time in a particular key position. More on this later. If you suspect a reception condition, again, the form will help you determine exactly the nature of the problem. Is it only on FM, AM, or both? Or perhaps the condition exists on only one station. But the most valid reception check is have the customer show you where the problem occurs. Here is where specific knowledge of radio stations in your area and personal judgment will come into play. For example, how strong is the signal? Does the problem only occur near tall buildings? Is the condition normal or do you believe the customer's complaint is valid? If you are still not sure, then drive another vehicle with similar options. If the condition is the same, more than likely it's not the fault of the audio system. Bottom line, you must know the various stations in your area, which ones are strong and which ones are weak. Also, you must know the lay of the land and its effects on reception, be it country roads or city streets, and most importantly, you must be able to explain this to your customer. If you need more understanding of this subject, be sure to read the know-how reference manuals and the Delco Sound Service Guide. Now that the service advisor has completed filling out the form, the technician now has sound, accurate information to begin troubleshooting the audio system. The first step after verifying the customer complaint is to look for any service bulletins that relate to the condition you're working on. If there are none, then it's on to the diagnostic form. Remember the key position check the service advisor performed? Well, here's where it comes into play. Let's say the form indicates a noise is present both with the key in the key on engine running position and key on engine off position. But when going directly to the accessory position, the noise goes away after about seven seconds. The ECM can cause this symptom as it remains powered up for about five to 10 seconds after the ignition is turned off. In this case, moving the coax that was routed too close to the ECM fixed the problem. Another example could be a noise that is present for about two seconds in the key on engine off position, but returns continuously when turned to the key on engine running position. The culprit here is most likely the fuel pump which normally takes about two seconds to build up pressure, then shuts down until the engine is started. 
However, these initial tests may still leave you with little or no clue as to what is causing the noise or even how it enters the system. If this is the case, you will need to perform noise entry diagnostics. Basically, there are three ways noise can enter the system. Sideways, front ways, and back ways. Sideways noise is noise that enters through the radio case or any other audio system component, such as this tape deck. Front ways noise is when noise enters through the antenna, coax, or both. And lastly, back ways noise is anything other than front ways or sideways. Let's take a closer look at these now, beginning with sideways. If the noise is present on all speakers, loosen the mounting hardware and without disconnecting the harnesses, slowly pull or slide the radio out of the instrument panel. If the noise goes away or reduces in volume, it's a sideways noise condition. Here are several fixes that will work in most cases. If you can, move any harnesses that pass near the radio case. If this does not work, try shielding the harnesses. Using nickel or aluminum shielding tape, tightly wrap a braided ground strap against the harness as shown. When using shielding tape, do not leave any gaps. Lastly, connect the end of the braided strap to a good chassis ground. If the noise persists, you can ground the receiver case as well. First, attach one end of a braided ground strap to the receiver case. Next, attach the other end to a good chassis ground. And finally, cut the existing harness ground. This eliminates any potential paths for noise by removing the ground loop. Before we move on, take note that other audio system components can be subjected to sideways noise as well, such as this tape deck, which can pick up noise magnetically through the tape head. Returning to the initial check, if the noise did not go away when the radio was moved, perform a frontways noise check. Unplug the antenna lead at the receiver. If the noise stops, you know the problem is with the antenna system. Here are several fixes that will solve most frontways noise problems. Antenna ground is critical. Using a digital multimeter set on the ohm scale, check ground with one probe on a good chassis ground and the other probe on the antenna housing. The reading should be less than 0.2 ohms. Further antenna tests can be done with a digital multimeter set on the ohm scale. The procedures and measurements for these tests are in the know-how technician reference manual. If a power antenna fails the ground test, here's how to reestablish a good ground. First, loosen the mountings and retighten them beginning with the top bracket. This ensures the top of the assembly contacts the panel, which is the antenna ground plane. Then, tighten the lower bracket. Finish by torquing the bezel nut to specs. At this point, check to make sure the ground is now good using a digital multimeter. If a vehicle with a mast antenna fails the ground test, make sure all the mounting screws are clean and tight. Also make sure the mast is tightened properly. If the tests prove the antenna to be good, yet the noise still persists, try rerouting the coax away from various components or harnesses that can induce noise into the coax. Some coaxes, especially those on rear-mounted antennas, have more than one piece. Check to make sure the interconnections are secure and that no corrosion exists. Try wiggling the connection while an assistant listens to the radio. If the noise changes, try bending the barbs for a more positive connection. Note there are several types of coax connectors, as shown here. If the noise is strong enough, you may have to shield the coax, especially connections, which seem to be more vulnerable to noise. First, begin wrapping the coax with shielding tape. When you get to the connection, tape one end of a braided ground strap tightly against the inline connection. Continue taping, keeping the other end of the ground strap exposed. Next, Connect the ground strap to a good chassis ground, 
making sure not to compromise any existing grounds. There may be other inline connections that require shielding as well. Noise that remains unchanged after both frontways and sideways tests have been completed is called backways noise. Many times, backways noise can be isolated using the key test. If it can't, try removing fuses one by one. When the noise goes away, you know it's more than likely either a component on that circuit or the component's wiring. Using the service manual, identify what components are on the circuit and try to isolate them either at the component itself or at the fusible link until the noise goes away. Once the component has been identified, follow proper service manual diagnostics to ensure the component is operating correctly. Check all grounds and look for known conditions by reviewing service bulletins and the Delco Sound Service Guide. If the noise is still present, here are several fixes for backways noise problems. If a motor, such as this wiper motor, is causing the noise, try installing a capacitor. First, locate the hot or power feed to the motor. Next, connect the capacitor in series with the power feed. Finish by connecting the ground tang to a good chassis ground. It's important to note here that there are various types and sizes of capacitors and filters. Use the technician reference manual or the service manual for the correct application. Another component that can be used to quiet noise is a filter. Filters are good for hums or buzzes. In this case, a filter is being installed on a blower motor. A filter is always installed in series and only in the power supply circuit. Notice that the ground lead is away from the noise source, which in this case is a blower motor. Keep in mind though, the noise source can be the power supply, so the leads would be reversed. Before connecting the ground lead, try it both grounded and ungrounded as one way might quiet the system more effectively than the other. Now that we've had a look at diagnosing noise problems, let's look at what can be done about reception conditions. As with noise, the diagnostic form again becomes one of the technician's most useful tools. It should indicate if the condition exists on AM, FM, or both, or on what station, geographic location, and so on. Once the condition has been verified, the first step is to check the antenna. The body surface the antenna is mounted to is actually a large ground plane in the antenna system. If a poor antenna ground exists, reception problems may occur. Check the antenna using the methods described earlier that are also detailed in the technician reference manual. If the problem still persists, try a test antenna and coax, making sure the coax has the correct size plug. When doing so, do not hold the antenna mast, but rather by the base. Also, make sure the test antenna is properly grounded. Next, have an assistant listen to the radio while tuning it to both high and low ends of the dial on both AM and FM. If reception improves with the test antenna, Further checks can be done to isolate the problem between the existing coax and antenna using the methods described earlier. If the reception remains the same, the radio should be repaired or exchanged. As mentioned in the beginning of this program, there are some new and improved steering wheel control diagnostics. But before we get to them, let's take a quick look at Buick's steering wheel control systems. To begin with, both the Regal and the Century can now be equipped with steering wheel controls. The main difference is the Century uses an integral radio system as opposed to the Regal's remote system. Functionally, the systems operate the same, but there are some component differences you need to be aware of. Both the Regal's and the Century steering wheel control head is made up of two parts, the keypad and the SWC module. Although these parts appear identical for both systems, they are different and cannot be interchanged. While we're on the subject, 
Section 8A of the Regal Service Manual states that the keypad and module must be replaced as a unit. This is not true. These are two separate components that do not have to be replaced as a unit. One area of SWC operation that seems to be misunderstood is the system optics. Optical devices are used to transmit steering wheel control data up and down the steering column instead of the slip ring and brush combination. Slip rings and brushes are fine for power supply, horn, and to ground, but not for the sensitive SWC data information, as the slip rings create too much electrical noise. The cancel cam has five optical devices and the turn signal switch has two. Here's a closer look at how they work. When the cancel cam and turn signal switch are assembled in the steering column, the optical devices line up like this. As a keypad button is pushed, a unique message is created in the module and sent to the cancel cam optical device. The electrical signal is converted to infrared light that is picked up by the corresponding optical devices and converted back into an electrical signal. As the steering wheel turns, the placement of the optical devices still allow two-way data communication. In fact, several of the optical devices can fail and the data will still continue to flow. However, if enough of them fail, an intermittent or hit or miss condition will occur. Earlier in this program, I said that 75% of all steering wheel controls were returned to Delco with no trouble found. One of the reasons was due to incomplete service information. So, to remedy this, new steering wheel control diagnostics have been developed. Currently, these new diagnostics can only be found in the Technician Reference Manual and in the new edition of the Delco Sound Service Guide. Basically, these new diagnostics consist of seven tree charts with headings related to the symptom. In addition to the charts, a new tool has been developed, the SWC Breakout Box Jumpers, number J37608-92A, 92A, 92B, and 92C, to be used with the current Breakout Box and the Tech 1. The best way to demonstrate the new charts and tool is to walk through an actual problem. In this case, none of the steering wheel controls work, but everything operates normally from the radio control head. Chart 3 best describes this problem. First, connect the Tech 1 to the data link connector, formerly the ALDL. With the ignition switch in accessory or run, select E and C followed by the identify mode. Now, wait to see if the radio receiver box is identified. Yes, it is. Following the chart, the next set of instructions is to select the Tech 1 E and C monitor mode. Next, press any steering wheel control button and see if the Tech 1 identifies the message. It does not. In this case, the chart says, with the ignition switch off, install the breakout box and new jumper tools as shown in Diagram 2. Diagram 2 details exactly how to connect the breakout box and jumpers. In this case, we're going to bypass the cancel cam and turn signal switch so the keypad SWC module and interface module can be tested. First, as illustrated in Diagram 2, connect the J37608 breakout box to the keypad and SWC module as well as to the interface module. Continue by connecting jumper tool J37608-92B to the breakout box. Now, connect one end of the jumper tool, J37608-92A, to the breakout box and the other end to the turn signal harness that was disconnected from the interface module. With the ignition switch in the accessory or run position, select the E and C monitor mode on the Tech 1. Next, press any keypad button and see if the Tech 1 identifies the message. Again, it does not. There's a couple more steps in this process that will allow you to isolate the components until the problem is found, but I think you get the general idea of how easy it is to use these new tools. Now, before we move on, 
Here's a few other steering wheel control service tips, especially useful for intermittent problems. Earlier cancel cams had a foam backing that covered solder joints. Check to make sure none of these joints have poked through the foam. These can short out, causing intermittent problems. If so, replace it with the newer Mylar backed cancel cam. Also, check the cancel cam slip rings for either no lubricant or too much lubricant. Excessive lubricant can cause the brushes to hydroplane on the rings, interrupting power. If the rings are worn or the nickel is grooved in any way, replace the cancel cam. Likewise, check the brushes on the turn signal switch for corrosion or any other signs of wear. Also, check to make sure the brushes spring up after being pushed down and released. Well, that's about it for this know-how. But one last very important point before we go. You may find yourself with a problem that just gives you fits. If so, have a service management representative contact your district service manager first. Included in the service advisor reference manual are specific guidelines for the process. This is a change from the previous system of calling Delco directly. Oh, by the way, this is another important use for the diagnostic form as your DSM will need this information in order to help you. Okay, that's all we have time for now. Look for us next month as we review the 1993 models. Ah, that's it. Yeah, the Red Onion Jazz Babies. <laughs>